Hello, Way family. Hope you all are doing amazing today. Thank you for joining in for our Devo. This is going to be a great week. I'm believing God's going to give you an incredible week full of joy, full of peace, full of his promises. He's a good God. He loves you. Call out on his name. He shows up always right on time. Let's pray real quick and invite the Holy Spirit to this devotional before we begin. Remember, we always want to invite the teacher before we study his book. Jesus, we just thank you. Holy Spirit, we ask you to help us. We just ask you to help us, Lord, in learning exactly what you want us to say. We thank you, Jesus, for this time. Holy Spirit, would you guide us? You're good to us, Lord. Thank you for saying exactly what we need to hear when we need to hear it. We thank you that as we open your word, it is your mouth speaking. We welcome your promises in your mouth into our life, your words into our life, your correction into our life, and everything we need in Jesus' name. Amen. So the book of Philippians is where we're at today, Philippians chapter one. To start out, let me give you a couple really, really interesting facts about Philippians. Number one, Philippians is written by Paul. Number two, it was written around AD 60 to 61, and it was during Paul's first imprisonment. So you got to know that's really important. The reason why that's important is because you'll read some of these verses in this chapter and you're going to be like, wow, a guy was writing this while in prison? Exactly. You see, people who have their heart and mindset on Jesus are not dissuaded by the circumstances around them. You can write victorious, beautiful things. You can have revelation. You can be praising God in the midst of a prison cell when your eyes are focused on Jesus. Remember, Jesus causes you to see life from a completely different perspective. Amazing. Uh, there's four chapters in the book. Of Philippians. It's pretty short. Uh, it's got 104 verses and it's got 2,002 words. Um, the purpose, once again, this was an unusual letter, uh, but it was a letter basically of, uh, of total thank you to the Philippian church. They were one of the only churches really that Paul had gone and visited that took care of him financially, that gave him uh, gifts, uh, financial gifts. Uh, really donating to his ministry that way. Um, Paul was, if you'll know, uh, Paul was also a tent maker. So even though Paul was preaching a lot um, all over to all these towns and these cities and these countries uh, or cities, um, he also was making his own money a lot of the time by working, by making tents. And so he was as much as possible trying not to be a burden to any church that he would go to, especially financially, because he just wanted to give them the gospel. He wanted to teach them. He wanted the spiritual harvest, he says, of their hearts, their souls. And he became many, many uh, people's spiritual father. But yeah, this church actually financially gave to him. They really, really blessed him. So uh, there's four chapters. Each one of them really has a theme, but it's a big celebration letter. Um, interesting about this as well, the words joy and rejoice occur more than 16 times in four chapters. So Paul is full of joy for this church. He's thanking them. Uh, he's giving them some advice, but it's basically all about Jesus and how Jesus is the answer for everything we need. Chapter one being Jesus is our life. Chapter two, the main uh, theme being Jesus is our example. Chapter three, the main theme being Jesus is our hope. And chapter four, the main theme being uh, Jesus is our strength and source of supply. And so this is an incredible book, all about Jesus. Go figure. Actually, the entire Bible is all about Jesus. Did you know that? From Genesis to Revelation, Jesus is all throughout the pages. The Bible is actually 66 books, all written by many different authors over, over a thousand years of span of time, all about one man. His name was Jesus. Pretty awesome. Let's start reading in verse one. We're going to go right through it. There's not too many verses. Let's have fun. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons. So who to it? To all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi. He's writing to the church of Philippi. Verse two, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is his normal address when he writes many, many letters. He says, grace and peace to you, grace and peace to you. It's really, really powerful. Once you study grace, you understand that grace is not just... Um, 
covering for your sin or like, oh man, I messed up again, but thank God for his grace. Grace, as we know from the definition of Paul in many of his writings as well, is actually God's power to do things beyond your own ability. It's God's ability to go beyond your own ability to be able to fulfill as well. So God actually helps us by giving us grace in the areas that we are not able to do his will, not able to, to meet the measure of what God requires. Grace makes up the distance between your failure and what God requires. So if you could have a measuring stick and God says, you know, hey, um, as, a, as a father, my requirement and my standard of what I'm asking you to do is at 12 inches, but you and your own strength can only make it up to four inches. Well, then grace actually is the extension of the covering within the last eight inches. It makes up the gap of the difference of what you cannot do. Grace is God's empowerment and ability that makes up the gap of everything you fall short on so that you can perform God's will. You can be able to do what God is asking you to do in the area of your, your marriage, in the area of, you know, it's going beyond yourself. Maybe you're like, man, you know what? I'm just not really a very patient person. Well, when grace gets involved, you have supernatural patience in a way that you normally don't. You're not usually naturally a patient person, but it goes beyond natural ability. That's what grace is all about. It's his empowerment that he gives us to go beyond our natural abilities so that we can do the things he's requiring and ask us to do. So for Paul to say this in his letters, grace and peace be to you. He's saying, I'm praying God's power, his supernatural ability that goes beyond your own ability and the peace of God to be to you. Beautiful opening to a letter. Verse three, I thank my God every time I remember you. So you got to think, how many people do you got in your life? When you think of them, you ain't thanking God. <laughs> there's some, there's some people's faces, right? There's some pieces name, you know, you say their name. <laughs> are you thanking God? Or are you like, oh man, let's just change the subject. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> right? You're like, I don't want to talk about them. He thinks about the Philippian church. He's like, man, every time I think of y'all, you guys were such a blessing to me. I thank God for you. Are you that kind of a blessing to somebody else's life? Are you the type of person that when they think of you, they thank God? Or are you the type of person when they're thinking of you, they're like, man, I need to go into some prayer right now. I need to just, you know, I need help overcoming right now, man. Why'd you have to bring their name up, man? Why'd you have to talk about them, <laughs> right? Let's be the kind of people that people are thanking God that we're around and that we know them, amen? Verse four, and all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. They bring them a lot of joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, they've been partnered with him since he began. The Philippian church was partnered with Paul since he began his work. So they had a connection with him and they were partnering with him financially, as we'll see here in a little while. Uh, and they're partnering with him in prayer. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Now, you got to understand something. There's a very, very big key here. You've probably heard this verse quoted in many, many church circles. And I just want to bring it into context real quick. He says, being confident of this, he being Jesus, who began a good work in you, will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus. So people come up to you and might be like, man, he who began a good work in you is going to complete it. And that brings a lot of comfort. And in many situations, it really should. But remember Paul is not talking to every single Christian. He's talking to the people who have partnered with him financially and in prayer and support that because of their partnership, now he can say, man, the work that's beginning in y'all, God's going to complete it. Because of the step you've made in partnering with this ministry, the step you've made in partnering with what I'm doing, with what the gospel that God has called of changing souls, because you have partnered with something eternal, that's the key word, because you've partnered with something that will matter in heaven, I know that what God is beginning in you, your prayers are going to come to pass. And I know and I have confidence that he's going to finish what he started in you. You see, there's a key, there, there's a certain amount of people who this applies to. It's not actually every, just because you come to church does not mean you get every single promise. Do you understand that there's over 7,000 promises in the Bible? However, they're all potential promises. Listen, all of the promises belong to you when you are found in Christ. Absolutely. 
but they don't manifest themselves or you don't actually see them fully apprehended and fulfilled until you meet the requirements of the promises. Until you actually engage them, you have to say them with your mouth, you have to believe in them with your heart, you have to act like they're happening in your life, there's faith that's involved, there's a, a submission process, and remember more than any of that, promises, the 7,000 promises are all just potential until the Holy Spirit has time to illuminate those promises in your life and to actually make them real in your life. You see, this is the difference between being the kind of person who wants to just name and claim something without doing any of the obedience, without making any of the efforts, and without waiting on the Lord, waiting in the presence of God for Him to mature that promise in you, for Him to mature that seed. You see, because when you read a promise, it's a seed. But now giving the Holy Spirit by waiting on the Lord, by being with Him in His presence, by being with Him going over in His Word, you're now maturing the seed into finally giving birth without that time waiting with God, waiting on the Lord, being with Jesus in his presence. The Holy Spirit does not have time to mature and illuminate his promises into your life. You can't just go like this. Well, I claim this one. I need that right now. I claim that right now. Okay, so you found a promise. That's great. We all need to find the promise in the Bible, something to agree with. But now there's conditions. Now we need to fulfill the conditions through our obedience and get with the Lord and the Holy Spirit and allow Him to mature and illuminate that promise. This is so important that I'm saying this right now because so many people see something that happens in another person's life, how God answers this man of God's prayer or this woman of God or this person. And and, you know, some big thing that they do through God. And they're like, oh my gosh, God told them this and look at what happened. It happened. And then they try to do the same thing in their life because they're like, well, it's a good thing. I need that too. It's a promise in the Bible. So I want that as well. So then they just say, okay, God, you're going to do it. And then it doesn't happen. And then they get upset at God. But you understand that the people who God did that for, they spent time in his presence, maturing that word. They spent time with God. They said, Lord God. And the Lord spoke specifically to them about that specific thing. It wasn't, you can't live on somebody else's promise. You can't live on some word that he told Pastor Marco or myself or anybody else in your life. You need your own specific rhema word. Rhema means spoken in season, revealed right now. You see, remember the Bible is the logos. It's the written word. It's here for us. It's God's mind. It's what he thinks. This is the logos. And, and we can read it at any time. However, there is, once you read the logos and you get into his written word, he will then give you his spoken word. He'll speak to you in season for the exact things you're going through in your life. And that's what you need. When the Lord ignites a rhema word inside of you, when the Holy Spirit has time with you and he matures a promise, you see it first on the page, but then he ignites it. There is nothing that hell can do to stop it. There's nothing that man can do to stop it. There's nothing that's going to stop it because the Holy Spirit has illuminated and ignited the promise inside of you. I had to speak about this for just a few minutes because this is really important that people understand how this works. These are all potential promises for you. You could have all of them for sure, but you got to take them to the Lord. You got to have faith. You got to let them mature in your spirit and you got to listen to the word of God as he tells you the exact instructions to do. Don't go off of anyone else's relationship with God or what worked for them. Hallelujah. All right. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it out and on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Verse 7. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart. For whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. How, do you hear what he just said? All of you share in God's grace. You all are going to share in this supernatural power that I have on my ministry. Why? It's not all Christians. It's those who are partnered with his ministry. When they, these people, the Philippians, made the extra effort to partner financially and in prayer and in support with his ministry, what happened was they came under the same power and grace that is on his ministry. Did you know that's how it happens? When you partner with the Wayworld Outreach, 
When you give your tithes and offerings to the Wayward Outreach, you come under, it's one of the ways, there's many ways, prayer's another way, there's other ways as well, serving's another way, but it's one of the ways you come under the covering and anointing that's on the house. The anointing for souls, the anointing for leadership, the anointing for discipleship. You come under this same anointing and it comes on your house. It comes on you as a person, it comes under on your family. Powerful. God can testify, verse eight, how I long for all of you with the affection of Jesus Christ. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern, I love that word discern, what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ. So he's praying that people would engage and abound more in that supernatural power, that knowledge of the grace of God, that supernatural power that helps us go beyond our own abilities. And that part of that power would give us the ability to discern what is pure, what is right, and what shouldn't be a part of our lives anymore. Hallelujah. The Holy Spirit will help you to discern what you need in your life, what you don't. And every season, it's going to look different. Just want you to know, it won't be the same. It's going to look different. The closer you get with the Lord, the deeper He brings you into your to his presence, the deeper he brings you into your purpose, the different your season's gonna look. This that you did last season might have been okay, but this season is not gonna be all right. And it's not even necessarily that it's bad. Remember that God's not just telling people to get rid of things in their life because they're bad. Yeah, we of course we should all do that. But there's a level where it's not even that it's bad anymore. It's just that it's not worth your time anymore. God wants you focusing on this and this and this now. So he'll actually continue to bring your boundaries tighter and tighter in your life in order for you to grow. God continues to lessen and tighten your worldly freedoms. Listen, he continues to lessen your worldly freedoms in order for you to have more divine focus in order to grow. He'll lessen your exposure to your worldly freedoms. It doesn't mean you're not going to have fun anymore. Matter of fact, you're going to have more fun and more joy than you ever have. The closer and more intentional you get with your purpose. However, you'll feel that boundaries, the less things you feel you'll be able to do because God is taking your focus more time on divine things so that your purpose and your growth can happen. Hallelujah. Be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Verse 12. Now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. So him being in chains is what he's about to describe. It actually is really great. He's like, this is awesome. It's really advancing the gospel. <laughs> that's, that's Paul. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Jesus. He said, the reason why this is really good that I'm in chains is because everybody knows why I'm in chains. I'm in chains because of Jesus and I'm willing to give my life for him. He said, this is a good thing. Everybody's getting a testimony and they're getting a sermon just by seeing me in here, asking why I'm in here. And they all know it's for Christ. Because of my chains. Now look at this. He credits this to because of his chains. It's so great. Verse 14, because of my chains. Most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. Wow. Because of what you thought was bad for me, I knew that this is a promotion. Because what this is doing for me is giving me the opportunity to inspire other leaders to give their lives the same way I'm giving my life. To be as bold as I am being. You see, through my example of giving my entire life, surrendering to the Lord, and you want to be able to say this about your life, you are inspiring others to give their lives for God, to give their focus to the Lord, to be encouraged to speak like Jesus, like you do, to be encouraged to walk with dedication to Jesus like you do. Are you an inspirer of people for Jesus? Hallelujah. Let's all pray to be that. We want to be that. Verse 15, it is true that some preach Christ out of envy or rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so in love, knowing that I am put here in the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. So there are actually people who preach for different reasons. He's trying to say not everybody has a pure motive when they preach. Verse 18, 
But what does it matter? I love Paul's words. But who cares? Who cares what they're saying about me? Who cares that they're trying to make me look bad? The important thing, this is what he says, is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is being preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Listen, that right, does that right there sound like a man who is competitive or comparing himself to anybody else? Does that right there sound like a man who cares if somebody else is preaching, if somebody else has a big church, if somebody else has a great company? You see, guys, it's sad to say, but in many areas in the church, we are fighting with competition among our own. We can't celebrate each other. We're not rejoicing with each other. Somebody else gets a victory or a promotion. Somehow you feel like it's taking away from something in your life. Now somehow you have less. Uh, now somehow there's less influence you could have because this person getting more influence on Instagram than you are. Or this person's getting more. I don't know. This person has a massive DG. You only have four people and they're getting more people. So somehow there's less people for you now. Really? Guys, there's millions of people that are going to hell. Have you ever thought about this? Jesus said, the fields for harvest are plentiful, but the laborers are few. In other words, I want everybody I possibly can get to start winning souls. Guys, when somebody who's a brother in Christ or a sister in Christ gets promoted, whether it be anything, we should celebrate. Whether they, if they get more influence, we should celebrate that somebody who loves Jesus, somebody who's pure, somebody who wants God's will is getting promoted. Why? Because their influence is going to win more to Christ. It should be about souls. It shouldn't be about who has this many and this has many. We should be in a place where we're not competing with anybody else, but we are cheering each other on because you know what? We need all hands on deck, y'all. We need everybody in the fight for the Great Commission. Souls matter. Jesus is thinking of all of them. He wants as many people as possible, an army, to be damaging hell and help him populate the kingdom of heaven. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. What has happened to me will turn out for good. Can I say something to you? What has happened to you? You might have thought it was terrible. When God gets done with you, when he completes, when he does not stop in completing the work that he began, but he finishes it on through completion, you're going to see some serious glory be given to Jesus. It's going to turn out right. It's going to turn out all right. God has your back. Verse 20, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. As long as I'm in this body, I'm living this life for Jesus. If I die, I'm with Jesus. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the Bible. Listen, I know this is hard to, and we can't get too deep into this, but you've got to understand what's happening right now. Paul is literally at the point where he's deciding whether he wants to give up his spirit and go to heaven or he wants to stay with us. Can you imagine? In other words, death and sickness have no claim on Paul. He's like, you know what? I'm just trying to decide if I want to go now or if I want to stay with you. This man has a connection with the Lord. He's like, man, I'm really tempted. I just want to be with Jesus, but I'm going to keep my spirit here in this body right now because I'm not completely done. Do you have that kind of a say over your life or are you under the circumstances? Are you allowing life and other things to dictate your future? Or do you say, you know what, devil? You know what, circumstances? Uh, God actually is the one who has a say over my life and I'm not going till I'm supposed to. Whew. Hallelujah. I'm not out of here until God says it's my time. Oh, uh, come on. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. Verse 26, so that through my being with you again, your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. 
Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Guys, this is something I ask myself all the time. Have you asked yourself the same? If you were to look at your life right now, all the habits you have, all the things you do on a weekly basis, the way you spend your time, the way you speak to your family, the things you study, the things you're reading, would you say that you're conducting your life right now in a way worthy of the gospel that Jesus has given you? It's a great question. And you know what? It should bring conviction and it should bring joy because you know the Holy Spirit's gonna help you to finish the work that he's completing in you. He's with you all the way, y'all. He's partnering with you to give you strength because of his grace. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel. When we get in one spirit as the body of Christ, contending as one person, the bride of Jesus, with our faith for the gospel, without being frightened, he says, in any way by those who oppose you, don't get intimidated. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved and you will be saved by God. Let's get in one, in unity of one spirit, one mission, with one, as if we were one person. That's, that's beautiful. There's no competition able to stay in that. Hallelujah. For it is, verse 29, has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but to also suffer for him. Not a popular verse, but I just want you to know, when we serve Jesus, you're going to get some persecution. It's not just given to you to just believe in him. You might suffer for him as well. There might be some people gossiping about you. There might be some things that people want to come against it. But just know, when you're serving Jesus, persecution is part of that. But God is congratulating you for serving him and for doing that. That's why persecution comes. Verse 30, since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. So in other words, Paul's like, listen, we got persecution before. The persecution is not going to stop. I'm going to serve God all my life. Do you hear the determination in him? Do you hear how there's nothing that can happen that the enemy can do to take Paul's life? Death doesn't have a hold on him. People's words don't have a hold on him. He's set free because he's committed to the calling God gave him. You see, when you're in your calling, you're in your destiny, you're in the purpose that the Lord put in your life and you're fully committed to it, not halfway in, halfway out, fully committed. You're not afraid of people. You're not intimidated by the lies of the enemy. You're not gonna be held back by anything else because Jesus, you know, is the victor. He is our life. He has your back. And when he begins something, he'll partner with you every step of the way to complete it. God bless you all today. Hope you have an incredible time. Get into this chapter. Enjoy your time. Talk about it with your DG. Talk about it with your families. Make sure you're using the growth book for your families. Make sure you're in the word of God. Open the Bible every day in your house. Don't just let it be something you do by yourself. Open it up to your children. Open it up to your, uh, to your wife, to your husband. Make sure you're talking about it. It really helps concrete God's promises and it forms an atmosphere in your home that the enemy cannot get a part of. God bless you all. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thank you.